Uh, next speaker is uh, Cedric Lander, and we'll have a series of uh, four more talks, and then we'll be done for the morning. Thank you all uh, for listening to my talk today and for having me here. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm talking about mutation set of recrimination, and it's going to be more of a computational talk. And um, so, um, so right now we have around 100,000 genomes available in the databases, and we face the problem that that's a lot of data, but we have to get information out of that data. And um, what people usually think about when they think about um, what information is in genomes, they think about the genes themselves, protein coding sequences, um, protein structures, re regulatory element, things like that. Um, what I'm more interested in is um, extracting more evolutionary components. Um, protein synthesis rate, um, selection and translational efficiency, and mutation biases. And to get at that, I'm looking at codon usage bias, and just as a very brief recap, um, codon usage bias is the differential usage of codons, of synonymous codons. Um, and it can be driven by either mutation bias, being a, a difference in, caused by a difference in nucleotide stability, um, or by a selection component. In this case, I'm thinking about translational efficiency. So codons can vary in their ribosome pausing time, how long the ribosome needs to translate a codon, and how what the error rate is to translate that codon. Um, and so, to get at that, I'm using a mechanistical model that was developed in the Gilchrist lab, and I'm trying to walk you through that, uh, take a little extra time here to make clear what's going on. So we're looking at mutation bias, translational efficiency, and protein synthesis rate. And so we can think about, um, so mutation bias, well, clearly that's mutation. And we can think about selection as uh, a product of the translational efficiency, which you can think of as like directionality of selection, and uh, the synthesis rate phi, you have to love your Greek letters, um, as a scaling of selection. And so um, these plots here show how the probability of observing a codon in a sequence changes with the expression level, with the strength of selection. So you basically, on the left, you have uh, phi values, synthesis rate values, that are very low. So you, uh, basically what happens is, as phi tends to zero, that selection term tends to zero, and you get a system that is predominantly dominated by mutation. And once you increase uh, the synthesis rate, you increase that uh, term, that selection term, and you get a system that is predominantly uh, selection driven. And what that, al what that also shows is that the uh, favorability of codon changes with expression level, and it's not just a static number. Um, um, what looks like error bars here um, is actually the genes of the genome being binned by their um, uh, gene expression and showing the mean and the variance in their codon usage. And so, and I like to apply that model to uh, Lechancia cleveria, which is quite an interesting yeast species because it seemed to have um, experienced a fairly recent uh, lineage specific introgression. So, the left arm of chromosome C. Um, seems to have introgressed from uh, a different species, and that becomes apparent because what you see is that what, if we basically look at the GC content across the whole genome, we see that if we, once, if we go along the chromosomes, we have a consistent GC content, and once we reach the C left, this left arm of that chromosome C, we see uh, a spike in GC content. That, that's about a 13% 13, 13 difference. And um, C left is around one megabase pair long, containing roughly 10% of the genes of that Cleveria genome. And so basically, what I'm wondering is, um, well, does it matter? Um, so we see the difference in uh, GC content. What impact does that have? Does the codon usage bias change? How does it affect um, our estimates of parameters of interest? Uh, how does it affect what information we get and how reliable the information is we get from that genome? And so the short answer is yes, it matters. Uh, model selection shows us um, we are favoring the alternative hypothesis. We are having a heterogeneous genome. But I think what is more interesting is if we compare the results we are getting um, under the null hypothesis and under the alternative hypothesis. Um, in both cases, we see that we can predict protein expression 
by comparing our estimates to mRNA abundance as a proxy. And, um, but I think what is more interesting is uh, that we are basically, if you look at the y-axis, you see that we're compressing the genome along that synthesis rate axis. And um, the other thing, so, and, th and that is important for two reasons. As I said earlier, phi, the synthesis rate, is basically a scaling for selection. So by having a genome that has mostly invariant in gene expression, the model predicts invariance in uh, selection. And um, also, we're, the, the information about selection and mutation lies in the tail end of the distribution, so we're relying on low-expression and high-expression genes, which we are mostly eliminating under the null hypothesis. And the last thing I think is very interesting is that you see that we have the separation between the red and the black dots, the red being C left and the black dots being main, the rest of the genome. And um, that becomes very interesting if we look at the codon usage uh, plots, in this case, just as an example for cysteine, two codon amino acid, um, that on the left side we see, we see that compression of genes. They're all here in the middle. Um, and what we observe is that our um, selection pattern on the right here, where we have the high expression genes, we are favoring TGT, same as in main. So we are showing the same selection patterns, which is not surprising. We have classified all the genes that are on the main part of the uh, genome um, as high expression, medium to high expression genes. But, and we classify everything, and we have a mutation pattern that is consistent with what we observe on C-left under the null hypothesis. Again, not surprising, because we say we, the model classifies um, the, the genes on C-left as low expression. I think, but I think what is even more interesting is that basically what you can do is you can think of placing this main plot to the right of the C-left plot, and what you get is you see how the TGT content um, declines. You see that here, and then if you keep going on the C-left plot, you see how they switch favorability on the mutation side, which you see here. So basically, if you only look to the right on this plot, you get the main estimates, and to the left, you get the C-left estimates. So you're basically, you're creating a mean, like a, uh, or a mixture of the two um, chromosomes, of the two parts of the genome. And so then we can look at what actually differs. Um, and we see that mutation bias seems to differ more than selection bias. Um, we have a negative correlation for our parameters of mutation bias. We observe mostly consistency um, on the translational side. So um, if you think about it in quadrants, right, we have um, most, G most of these dots occupy the plus, minus, minus, plus realm of your, um, uh, and um, only a few end up in the plus, plus, minus, minus range where you have consistency uh, in sign, in directionality. And um, so if we look at these code and usage plots, then here for three, um, uh, two code on amino acids, just for the ease of uh, digesting these plots, um, what we see is that for cysteine and uh, glutamine, we observe what I told you, what I just told you. We observe that there is a difference in mutation bias. We are favoring different codons here, TGT over TGC. And we see the opposite, TGC over TGT um, on the mutation side of things. While if we move to the right where selection becomes dominant, we favor the same codon. And we see that for CT ending and uh, AG ending codons. There are exceptions to that. Uh, if we're looking at aspartatic acid here, we see that both the uh, codons, both mutation and selection favor the opposite codon. So we have uh, total inconsistency here. And um, that leads me, so now that I showed you that this is important, um, let me just very briefly switch gears before I wrap that up and bring it back together. Um, we want to know where that came from. Well, the hypothesis is, the standing hypothesis, that it's an introgression. Uh, the hypothesis that it's an Lachancier that is unknown at this point. Um, why did people conclude that? Well, because um, other Lachancier genomes have an organodactorically and functionally equivalent left arm of chromosome C, but without um, that uh, GC feature or that codon usage bias feature. And um, if we're trying to place 
um, cluverii on a phylogeny, on a yeast phylogeny, using genes that are located on main or on C left, we observe a consistent placement. So it has to be something that is close by under this hypothesis. And the other thing is we're um, assuming that um, at this point, C left is likely still adapting to its host environment. Um, we observe a higher uh, substitution rate in that um, in progression, and we uh, and it's estimated that um, the regression is still fairly young. And so then what we're doing is um, basically we're saying, okay, now we can create a face, uh, face plane of evolutionary trajectories. People that work with ODEs are familiar with that idea um, that you think about how, fl how something flows through space. Um, and so basically what I'm showing you here is um, the black dots are yeast species we have filled in so far. Um, the main dot, the, the blue dot is the cluverii main part of the genome, and the red dot is the C left in that codon usage space. And um, so we can think about how um, C left will approach the equilibrium, and we can think about what path it has taken so far to adapt to the point it has come. And um, the other thing I think that's important is that this path depends on um, effective population size. So if we say, so these three lines here represent possible trajectories um, that C left might take or might have taken um, given different NE values. So we see that, um, uh, that the solid line representing a small NE value basically saying, well, mutation and selection adapts at a very similar rate, giving us a potential origin, well, somewhere out here. If we increase the effective population size, um, the difference in selection we see, but, uh, the in selection bias we see between these two um, parts of the genome decays faster than the mutation bias. And if we increase NE even more, which becomes more reasonable than to what we observe in yeast um, in general, um, we see that um, uh, the selection bias decays even faster. And that would be consistent with what we observed, right? We, we observed I showed you these plots where we have a negative correlation between the parameters for mutation bias we estimate between these two um, genomes, uh, between two genomic regions, and um, we have a positive in selection bias. So saying that possibly we are observing a snapshot and so the, most of the variation that was present by, at the time of the introgression in selection bias has already decayed. And so let me just... Uh, wrap things up and say, well, okay, so we have, um, we have uh, tested uh, two hypotheses about the variation in that genome. We saw that um, taking that, uh, that variation into account matters and we get more reliable, better estimates of the parameters we're interested in. We, are, um, we can attribute most of the heterogeneity we see at this point in time to mutation bias, and that selection bias, uh, that the difference in selection bias seems to um, decay faster. Um, and again, C, le C left is likely still adapting, and due to the large effective population size, um, we see the effects we see. And um, well, with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Mike Gilchrist, and my committee, and the whole Gilchrist Lab, and my funding sources, and take your questions. Questions? Is there such a thing as a thermophilic yeast? Because GC content is often high in things that live in really hot environments. I did not understand that at all. Uh, yeah, there's so if you look in hot springs, like Archaea have crazy high GC content because it literally holds the duplex together better with more hydrogen bonds. Is it, is it crazy to think there might be a hyperthermophilic yeast that is the source of this thing? Uh, so you're saying that um, an Archaea could be the potential source of that? No, he's uh, asking about thermophilic. Is it, is oh. these yeast are thermophilic? Um, no, they, none of them seem to be a, a thermophilic. But maybe there is a thermophilic Lachantia out there where it came from that we don't know yet. Yeah, I had one question. Uh, it, it seems that your uh, uh, the the bias in mutation is always the opposite direction of the bias in selection. At least what you showed. It, 
in principle, that doesn't always, I mean, I, I can't think of any biological reason why that always has to be true, but do you have an explanation for that? Is it general across all um, amino acids? Well, so um, I would say no. And uh, here, if you look at cysteine and glut uh, glutamine for the main part, we see that uh, mutation and selection favor actually the same codon. Um, so, no, there, there is no general trend that mutation and selection favor opposite codons. Okay. Thank you.